Good morning. Good morning. What a beautiful day like this. Where the sun is not is out, but it's not actually waking. <laughs> so can you look to your neighbor and say hello, welcome. We wait for the world to be unrolled, for the word of God to take root, to hold us, to shake us, to call us into a world as God's people with the good news, the good news inviting everyone to have life in abundance. May our ears be open to what it calls us to do for the poor, what the word of God calls us to do for the captive, for the prisoner and the blind. Let us wait. Let us be ready. Let us worship God together as we stand to sing our first hymn, All People That On Earth Do Well. <laughs> Might live it 
and humble ourselves when we fail to do so. Great God of the kingdom community, the God of the poor, the captive and the oppressed, the blind, we gather as one, joined together because we are gathered in all our diversity and need and praise you for who you are. We praise you for your goodness. We praise you for your message that endures forever, all the time. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> what stops you from flourishing? What stops you from flourishing? What stops you from realizing your full potential? And people might be saying, do I still even have the potential? <laughs> what stops you from doing what you think God intends you to do? How can we flourish as cow or cat? And this one is more personal. What do I need to do to make it easy for the next person to flourish? What do I need to do so that the next person can flourish. Let us end to sing our next hymn, Guide Me, O Great Jehovah. <coughs>
uh, Mr. Jimmy Mitchell's funeral is on the 17th here in Tower at 11.30. Let us pray together. This spirit upon you, this inspiration of life, the inspiration of justice, inspiration of renewal, may we know it too for ourselves and for our living towards others. This good news to the poor and the captive, the good news to the blind and the oppressed, may we hear it too and turn it outward into the world. This release from captivity, from the world's ways, the world's injustice, may we recognize it too in our own souls and be moved by it for the sake of others. This recovery of sight, regaining our vision for justice, regaining our vision for healing and freedom, may we catch it too and see what others cannot. This freedom of life from bondage, the freedom of life from dullness, from uninspiring politics and faith, may we proclaim it too because it is real in us. May we shout this good news in the congregations and the churches. Shout the good news in marketplace. May your spirit be upon us and may, we, may it empower us, may it encourage us, may it provoke us, may it disturb us. Hear us as we pray for others, those that are mourning the passing of loved ones. May they be comforted by your spirit. Those struggling with illness and other issues, may they find peace and comfort in you. Hear the prayers we make for ourselves in silence. We give you thanks, for we know you hear our prayers. We pray in us, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now we listen to the scripture readings from Luke chapter 16, Luke chapter 4 from verse 16 to 30. Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom, and he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, and recover recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were clasped on him, and he began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him, and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked. Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Do hear in your hometown what you have heard that you did in Capernaum. I tell you the truth, he continued. No prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years, and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zephyr, in the region of Zidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elijah, the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Nahum the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this, they got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built, in order so they could throw him down the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Amen. May God add this reading from his blessed word. 
Thank you, Lynn, for reading the scripture lessons to us. We will stand to sing one of the forgotten hymns <laughs> when I need it. <laughs> Sundays. So that somebody can also come and enjoy. 
enjoy and be a part of the custom of what? Showing up. Yeah. So Jesus shows up into the temple. And when he shows up there, it says he was given a scroll to read. And when he, when he was given this scroll, he read it. But before we zero in on the reading that he had, he said to have attended the synagogue. And the synagogue was so important in the Jewish religious life. During the exile, when the Jews were no longer able to meet in the temple, synagogues were established. They were established as places of worship on the Sabbath and places where boys, young boys, could be taught during the weeks. And it is important that even when the temple was rebuilt, synagogues were still permitted to exist. And the important part or the exciting part is wherever there were 10 Jewish families, a synagogue was established. You see how now we are trying to rebuild worshiping communities and all that, we are actually going back to what it has been. Wherever there were 10 families, a synagogue was established. In smaller groups, people did meet. So Jesus showed up there. And I would want also to just tell you how a typical service in a synagogue would start. It was opened uh, with God's blessing, and then they would recite the traditional Hebrew confession of faith. And the traditional confession of faith was Deuteronomy chapter 6 from verse 4 to 9. Here, today we are like Jews. Hear what they would recite during the day. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk about along the road. When you lie down and when you get up, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your homes and on your gates. Who, when last did we sit around as a family to recite what we believe? To remind each other of our commitments to our faith. When last did we pray together as a family? When was the last time you were deliberate in professing your faith? When you literally say, today as a family, let's, let's remind each other. The decide to all say, talk about them. Tell them to your children. Now, my child is coming for the fancy way. My son thinks I'm backward. He looks like One day he just looks up and says, So, you're so old fashioned. Oh, really? <laughs> but when last did we do? When we deliberate and say, Let's talk about it. My children, sit down. My grandchildren, sit down. I want to tell you about what I believe in. I want to tell you what is important to me. So that's how a traditional uh, synagogue service would start. So, fast forward to what happened. Jesus showed up, and it was, it was the custom of the day that when they had a visitor, they would invite him to come and read the scriptures and share a sermon. So Jesus stood up, and when he stood up and unrolled the scroll to read it, he was actually reading from Isaiah chapter 61, from verse 1 and 2. And he selected that as his text. And when he finished reading it, he closed the book and sat down. Back in the day, they did not preach like I'm doing. They would actually be seated down, sitting down together. And they sat down. And the scripture reading that he read, the rabbis of the day had always interpreted this passage to point and refer to a coming Messiah. They said the Messiah is going to come. And when he comes, 
The Spirit of the Lord will be upon you. When he comes, he will set captives free. When he comes, he will open the eyes of the blind. When he comes, he will bring salvation to his people. This was what every rabbi would do when they opened this text. But much to the surprise of everyone in that day, when Jesus read that scripture, he then said, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your sight. Oh, my word. What? <laughs> the boy that we have seen, the son of Mary and Joseph, you telling us that the scripture has been fulfilled in us here and today. Not a chance, my boy. Not a chance. Not a chance. You are not getting, in fact, it is said that they were so angry that they took him out of the temple and wanted to what? To kill him. Friends, one truth that is hard to comprehend is the notion of thinking that, do you know what? Jesus was killed with believers. It was not non believers that killed Jesus. No. It was the religious system of the day that killed Jesus. Those that were part of the temple and the synagogues, week in, week out. Those that were in the habit of showing up as we do, were the ones back in the day that made sure that he was crucified. Why? He rocked the boat. We all have to keep the peace, huh? Eh? Even after the Christmas. There were some that were cringing. Family was up, but hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> Their time was up. You wish that after the meal, they would just went, but you, you, uh, you just had to keep the peace of the heart. Or the family, oh, what can I do? You just pray for it. But if you all truth be told, you just wanted them out of your house, you know what? In a flash. Or if you were invited, you were looking to your spouse and say, I'm not going next year. That's me, damn <laughs> So Jesus stood up. And when he stood up, fed, he then says to the people, I'm bringing you the good news. I'm celebrating with you, friends, today that the blind will see. And when he said the blind will see, they had heard news that he had opened the eyes of the what? Of the blind. When he said captives will be set free, then sure they had heard the stories of him casting out what demons. So he was not talking about myths and he was reminding them of the things that he had done. So Jesus came with a different message, a message that people would connect with, a message that would bring healing to the brokenhearted, a message that gave hope to the sinner. A message that gave hope to those that were regarded as outcasts. What was Jesus saying in an action? Jesus was saying, I preach that the great atonement of sin has been offered. He's coming to say, now there is a permanent solution. He is coming to say, I am offering myself to deal with the issue of sin, the matter of sin for good. He's saying, I'm coming to reconcile people, to connect people with their creator again. What he's saying is there is forgiveness of sins. There is therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ. He's saying you are accepted as you are. Did you know the message of the world is you've got to be good enough in order for you to belong. You've got to be good enough so that you can fit in into a certain clique. You've got to try hard in order for us to accept you. But the message of Christ is saying you are accepted as you are. Just as you are. And that's the beauty of the gospel, friends. You don't have to try hard for you to fit in. Just as you are. And that's the message that got in my head and turned my head upside down. You know what I love about myself? <laughs> One thing that I love about myself is this. 
I know I'm unique. There's no one in this entire world like me. Go anywhere. You never, even if the person it was born on the same day as me, with the same name as me, there's no one like what? Like me, I'm unique. And you know why I need you? No. Oh, now let me tell you myself. <laughs> I need you because there's no one like you. Travel anyway, old friends. There's no one like you. We are accepted just as we are. Don't try to save yourself. Don't try hard just as you are. Friends, you don't have to be good enough in order to belong. Come as you are. That's why I say, what do I need to do so that the next person can flourish? I need to accept the next person just as they are. As noisy as you are, I could accept you. As quiet, as laid back as you are, I accept you. As confused as I am, you better love me. <laughs> Just as you are, that is the message that Christ comes to bring. But the religious system back then had to tick certain boxes for you to what? To belong. You had to do certain rituals for you to what? To belong. But Christ comes and says, that is done. The grace of God is offered to all. Isn't that good news, friends? <clears throat> that we stop trying and we just come. That is the best news ever. Friends, what is Christ saying? He's saying, I preach that the guilty may be forgiven. He's coming with the message of forgiveness. He's saying, I preach that the slaves may be emancipated, that there is liberty, that there is freedom. He preaches that, you know what, we are co-heirs with him. We have an inheritance in God. After he had delivered this message, he actually goes further and says, you know what, I've come to say the year of Jubilee. After every seven years, the, year, the land had to rest. And in the 50th year was after seven sabbaticals. Then the land was, there was no farming that was done. The land was left to recover. And it, and it was regarded as the year of Jubilee. And Christ then comes and says, I'm offering that year of Jubilee, both physically and spiritually. We are set free. Yes. That bondage, that power of sin, no longer does hold. But what did they expect of him when he showed up? They challenged him and said, you know what? Can you perform a miracle for us? All they wanted was a performance from him. All they wanted was for him to show him a sign. But it, Jesus had nothing to do with that. He was one guy who was admired but rejected. They admired him from a distance, but they, but they, mm, they didn't like him. Why? Because Jesus began to remind them that God's goodness was not exclusive. God's goodness was for everyone. And that is our message, friends. The message of the cross is that everyone is not beyond God's reach. Everyone is not beyond God's love. And it is said that when you preach that message, the congregation began angry. The religious leaders became angry. And now when we see people, who can become angry with that? Well, St. Augustine says this. They love truth when it enlightens them. But they hate the truth when it accuses them. They love the truth when it what? Enlightens them. But they hate it when it what? Accuses them. Isn't this our friends? We love to talk about it when we're talking about someone else. But when it's about us, no. We love it when we say the church has to change. Something has to change. Oh, that's good news. 
But when we say, you have to change, no. <laughs> oh, something has to be done. Uh, something has to, we really have to change the way we do things. We have to change where we sit, how we sit. But when we say to you, move yourself, then there is a problem. We love it when it enlightens us. But we hate it when it's that personal. Say it to my son again, sorry about that. We really, I, I thought it was cold. So I said it to my kids. Guys, I think you need to put something warm. So, we have to say, and I then ended that statement by saying, this is what I think. And guess what my son then replied to me? He then said to me, you're overthinking this thing. <laughs> 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 <sighs> Six year old. <laughs> Telling me that I'm overthinking this is. Well, it was good enough for us suggesting, but it was tempted to me, I had a problem with it. And I always had a problem with it. And guess what I had to do, my friend? This is not up for discussion. <laughs> discussion is what? It's close. But there is a perfect example. In fact, John the other day, the big joke reminded me, John Pierce was home, reminded me when I say, put on something more. He actually said to me, every day, it's actually you who's feeling cold. <laughs> <laughs> but what am I saying in that light a moment and all that? We love it when it's not close at home. We love to talk about it when it doesn't make us move. But the message of Christ is that personal. It challenges us. This is why again I ask, say, what do you have to do so that cow can change it? So just about talking about changing it, what are you on a very personal level? What are you willing to change? What are you willing to reconsider? What are you willing to readjust? What are you willing to give up? What are you willing to do extra so that somebody else can flourish? So that the kingdom of God can what? Can flourish. It is amazing that when Christ says, I preach freedom, that somebody will be upset with freedom. But it came with a personal cause. So I, I, I resonated so much with what Augustine says. We love the truth when it enlightens us, but we hate it when it accuses us. We hate it when it challenges us. Friends, this is the message of God. The message of God that says we all have got to flourish. We all have to embrace the freedom that Christ offers. We have to accept the forgiveness that he offers. We have to lay, to lay down our lives so that others may flourish. John chapter 3 verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not die but have life, what? Everlasting. I love 1 John 3 verse 16. 1 John 3 16 then says, this is how you know what true love is. As Christ laid his down, as Christ laid down his life for us, we ought to lay down our lives for others. We ought to do the same for Christ. And I want to end by reading something that I thought was wow. This is about a footballer. Sorry if you don't like football. <coughs> this is about a footballer. A guy named Trent Alexander Arnold who plays for Liverpool. He's a young boy. He's doing well, I think, because he plays for my team, I think. So, <laughs> but when he won the Champions League, 
he was asked to talk about you know how he got there and what it meant for him and he then wrote and said my brothers weren't just my brothers they were my best friends as i got a bit older and i moved up through the liverpool academy tyler and marcel willingly sacrificed their own dreams for mine i think maybe we all realized at a young age that being a professional footballer was more realistic for me. And my parents did too. That's a hard thing for a young lad to understand. There were weekends when mum couldn't take my brothers to their matches because I had to be at the academy at a certain time. And it was always them who made the sacrifice. To this day, I'm so incredibly grateful to both of them. That didn't move me. Here's the bit that moved me. Every step I took, we took. Every cap I got, we got. Every experience I had, we had. That's how it works where I come from. Every step I took, we do. Every camp I got, we got. Every experience I had, we had. That's how it works where I come from. That is the bit that got to me. And I wish we could say every step that you take, we all take. Every celebration that you do, we all celebrate. Every sorrow you have, we all share in that. That's what it means to flourish in the kingdom of God. I come from Africa, as you know. <laughs> and we have the concept of Ubuntu, where we say, you are because we are. It takes a village to raise a child. That's where we come. You are because and, I, and if I was to answer the questions, all the questions that I asked you, in particular to say, what does cow get me to do? You are because we are. We belong to each other. We are created to be a community, a community of believers. We flourish together. We fall together. It's like that movie, Dead Boys, I don't know if you've ever watched this. We ride together and we die together. Yeah. <laughs> the promise is that we are there together. This journey of faith, friends, whatever step we take, we take it. You see, the, the, boy, the child can agree with it. Hallelujah. <laughs> One person said, if you want to go far, go alone. But if you want to go furthest, go together. How do we flourish as cowhead when we decide that whatever step you take, we take it. Whatever you go through, we are going through it together. That's what it means to flourish. God, we thank you that you came to make a difference in our lives. Help us to, to make a difference in other people's lives. God, whose giving knows no end, we know how to say thank you when we receive. Right now, we say thank you as we give. In our givings, hear our heartfelt gratitude for all that you are and all that we are. Bless these gifts for your mission in the world. And bless the other gifts we must bring to your mission. Opening our eyes to know how you are calling us to participate and how we should think of the others. To regard others better than ourselves. Hear us as we pray together. Our Father. Amen.
before we sing our last hymn, um, if you would like to choose a hymn on your way out, Richard does have somewhere where you can write. And there's an interesting question on that that you should also answer that says, did you like the hymns today? <laughs> And, and I'm looking forward to somebody saying no. <laughs> and then when you say no, you then join in, in, in choosing your own what? Yes. yes. And when we do sing that hymn, then guess what? The next person who answers the question is Did you like the hymns? They might also say no. 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 So, anyway, they will be um, uh, forms for you to fill if you have a hymn that you would like us to sing as a congregation. Just get it from Richard Day and fill it in and hand it back. We will, in one way or the other, make sure that we, we do sing it. We will stand to sing our last hymn, with your end come. <laughs>
you are summoned to see me first. 